ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto detail. An organized gang of thieves has been stripping cars in your city. None of the stolen merchandise has turned up. There's no lead to the identity of the members of the gang. Your job, stop them. Smokers by the thousands are now changing to Chesterfield. No wonder. More and more smokers are learning this fact for themselves. Chesterfield, low in nicotine, highest in quality. A published fact proved by chemical analyses of the country's six leading cigarette brands. Chesterfield, the only cigarette ever with a record like this. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 13th. It was overcast in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Nelson. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 7.52 a.m. when I got to room 45. Auto theft. Morning, Joe. Hi, right, Bob. You seen Frank? No, he hasn't come in yet. Oh, all right. Hey, Joe? Yeah? When Art gets in, tell him down R&I, huh? Yeah, sure. Bob, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. What happened to you? Well, if it's all the same to you, I'd rather not talk about it. That bad, huh? You seen Joe? Yeah, he's over his locker. Thanks. Morning, Joe. What happened to you? Joe, I'd rather not discuss it. Well, what happened? All those scratches on your face there? Please, Joe. Well, I was just asking. Look pretty bad, huh? Joe? Yeah. Yeah. I look pretty bad, huh? I thought you didn't want to talk about it, she said. If word about this gets out, Joe, I ain't ever going to live it down. Is that right? I've been had, Joe. Cop for 12 years, I've been had. Well, what's it all about? You won't spread this around, will you? Look, I just asked you what happened. Now, if you don't want to tell me, I'll go along with you. You don't have to say a word. Come on, let's get on the reports. What do you say? You better get in touch with Bowles when he comes in and try to check some of these out, huh? You're not even interested, huh? All right. You want to tell me about it? Well, if you really want to hear. Go ahead. Well, last night I took Faye down to the store. She had a little shopping to do. Small stuff, you know. Potholders, dish towels, things like that. Yeah. I got a parking place right in front of the store, so I waited in the car for it. Mm hmm I was sitting there listening to the radio when this fellow walked up to the car. He leaned in the window and asked me if I had a minute. I told him I did and asked him what he wanted. Did you know the guy? Never saw him before. Didn't know him from Adam. Uh-huh. Right off, I could see the guy had trouble. How do you mean? Well, he looked real bad, like he'd been on a drunk for at least a week. Clothes were all rumpled up, looked like he slept in them for a week. You know how I mean. Yeah. What did this guy want to talk to you about? When I saw him, I figured he was going to put the bite on me, so I braced myself, you know? You braced yourself, huh? Yeah, you know. I'm a real sucker for hard luck stories. Faye's always telling me I should learn to stay away from those guys. She was just saying the other night that What did this I... guy want? Frank? Huh? Well, what do you want, this fellow that talked to you? Oh, well, he gave me this story about how he'd been on a bat and how he was broke and he needed some money to clean up before he went home. Mm-hmm. But he makes it real plain that he does not want a handout. Nothing for nothing. What do you suppose he meant by that? That's when he showed me the package. The package, huh? Yeah. What package? Well, the one he was carrying. Didn't I tell you that? No, you didn't yet. Well, you see, before I couldn't see it, then he showed it to me. It's all done up in tissue paper, ribbons and all. Paper was kind of dirty, like he'd been carrying it for a long time. Ribbon was a little tired, but it was there. Mm-hmm. So he asked me if I wanted to buy it. That was this package? Well, what was in it, he asked me if I wanted to buy that. Well, what was in it? He took off the paper and he opened the thing up. And Joe, inside is a brand new razor. Brand new. Worth 25, 26 bucks in town. What kind of a razor? 
Well, he said he'd let me have it for 20 bucks. No, what kind of a razor? You, just a razor, the kind you shave yeah, with? Yeah, an electric razor. Oh, well, you didn't tell me it was electric. Didn't I say that? Jim? No, well, you said he'd let you have it for 20 bucks just because he needed the money. Huh? Yeah, well, happened that I didn't have 20 bucks, you know me, so I told him I couldn't make a deal. Then he left, huh? No, Joe. Now, look, you wanted to hear it. Will you let me finish? Well, it takes you a little time. I have to keep drawing you out here. I'm sorry, Joe. I want you to get all the facts. Mm -hmm. We're officers together. We talked back and forth for a little bit. Guy finally said that I looked like I had an honest face. That's a new approach, isn't it? Joe. Well. So finally, he says you let me have the razor for 15 bucks. So I bought it. And that's how you cut your face up, huh, with that new electric razor? Well, in a way. You see, I had to buy some blades last night, and since I had the new electric, I didn't do it. Well, you don't need blades for an electric. No, it wasn't for the electric, Joe. It was for the old one that I had at oh, home. Oh, but you had the electric now. Sure, so and once I had that in my hand, I didn't want any blades. I see. Only thing I had in the house was a blade that was a week old. So I got up this morning, plugged in my brand new electric. What do you figure happened? Well, I'm going to take a real blind guess. It didn't run. How'd you know? Well, the same thing happened to Murphy over in robbery last month. There was a big laugh around here. You were one of the guys who laughed the most. Don't you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Miserable. Murphy know about this yet? No. I ain't about to tell him either. Mm -hmm. Right in, Smith. Yeah, Skipper. See you guys. Right. Close the door. Sit down. Thank you. What happened to you, Smith? Uh, it's a long story, Skipper. Well, you can tell me later. Why don't you guys take a look at this? What do you got there? Just saw Chief Brown on the way in. He's getting pressure from the corner pocket. They want this thing cleared up. What is it, Joe? Last few weeks, car stripping's taking a big jump. Not the usual line of stuff. Not just happening in certain neighborhoods. We got reports here from the Valley, Hollywood, Wiltshire, all of the divisions. Same thing's happening all over town. Uh-huh. Talk to the boys in the sheriff's office. They're getting it. Same in Burbank, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica. Doesn't seem to be any place they aren't getting to. How about the stolen stuff, Skipper? Any of it show up yet? Not that we can find. All the usual outlets have been checked. None of the loot can be bought. Any special kind of things being taken? Let him see those reports, Chum. Yeah, here. Thanks. Take a look. We're not messing with kids in this thing. The way the victims tell it, this gang can break into a locked car and lift the radio in under 10 minutes. They can pull all four wheels off a car in under six minutes. Insurance companies are screaming. They already got into the police commission. Chief Brown told me this morning he didn't care how we did it, but he wanted it stopped. Well, where do we start? Well, up to now, the investigation's been handled pretty much by the divisions. From here in, it's in your laps. Use as many men as you need, just bring the thieves in. You're not working on anything now, are you? No, we're not. We're just winding up that Gibson thing. Couple reports to finish. We should be through by noon. We'll turn the reports over to somebody else. I want you to start on this thing right away. Okay. Right, Skimmer. Anything you need, let me know. Right, we'll check you later. Right. Smith? Yes, sir? How'd you get all those cuts in your face there? Shaving? Well, in a way, yeah. Yeah, same thing used to happen to me. Why don't you get yourself an electric razor? Eight eleven a.m. Frank and I asked one of the other men in the detail to take care of the reports on the case that we'd finished, and then we started through the statements we'd gotten from Captain Nelson. From them, we got a pretty good idea of how the car stripping ring was operating. There seemed to be a definite plan for the thefts. Most of the stolen articles were in the luxury class. Only radios were taken from Cadillacs and Lincolns. Heaters were stolen from Chryslers. Special hubcaps from foreign cars were listed among the stolen property. We had the stats office make a run on the M.O. that we could piece together, but their information led us nowhere. In none of the reports was there a possible description of the thief. The times the cars were stripped and the locations where the burglaries occurred made it apparent that it was a large-scale operation. For the next two days, we talked to the victims. We double-checked the time of the thefts and the movement of the victims immediately preceding the car stripping. We asked about people loitering in the vicinity of the parked cars. None of the drivers who'd been victimized could supply us with any more evidence than they'd given us in their statements. Friday, June 16th, we checked the list of recent parolees from state penitentiaries and work farms looking for ex-convicts who'd been involved in cases of car stripping. The list of names we came up with were checked out, but they led us nowhere. In the meantime, the pressure from the citizens' groups in the city had gotten worse. At the end of the first week we'd been working on the case, the value of stolen articles reached about $500 a day. Additional officers were assigned to patrol the streets. Radio cars doubled the number of field interrogations they normally made, and although several arrests were made, the possibles picked up apparently had no part in the activities of the organized ring. On Saturday, June 24th, we got a call from an ex-convict. He asked us to come out to his garage and talk to him. Come on back here, fellas. We can talk while I finish up. All right. 
Hey, quite a place you got here, Al. Yeah, I've been pretty lucky. Got just about all I can handle now. And the way business is going, I'm going to have to take on some more help. How many men you got working for you now, Al? Two full-time. Saturdays, I got a couple of kids who come in and help out with the wash jobs. Uh-huh. Now, we can talk right here. Pull up a couple of those chairs. All right. There's a rag there on that bench if you want to wipe them off. They get a little dirty standing around. That's okay, Al. What do you want to see us about? Well, first off, I want to tell you guys that I appreciate the way you treated me when I fell. I'll never forget it. Real nice. Don't worry about it, Al. I read in the papers where you're getting a lot of heat on the stripping going around. Yeah, that's right. I just wondered how you're doing on it. That's well, going pretty slow. Why, do you know anything? Oh, I got a couple of rumbles. You know, it's hard not to hear them. Uh -huh. I heard that none of the stuff's been shoved, that right? We haven't seen any of it. Well, the way I get it, you aren't about to. Hey, hand me that socket wrench, will you? This one? Yeah, I have to... There you go. Thanks. A fella came in here a couple days ago. I knew him from before. He said he wanted to do business. Uh-huh. He asked me if I was interested in some good buys and used radios. Uh-huh. I told him I might be if they were good. He said these were the best, all GMs. Then he gave me the price. When I heard that, I knew something was up. What was he asking? I told him he could deliver six Cadillac radios for twenty-eight fifty apiece. I asked him where he got them. What did he say to that? He told me it wasn't any of my business. He said where he got them didn't make the radios play any different. What makes you figure he might be in on the operation we're after? Well, I told him that if he could make deliveries at that price, I'd want a lot more than a half a dozen. Yeah? Well, he said he couldn't supply them. He said that he only could spring six. I asked him if he was working alone. He told me no. I figured I ought to give you guys a call. It might be something for you. You said you know him, huh? Yeah, from before. Say, you guys like a cold beer? No, Alan. No, thanks, sir. Well, you mind if I have one? It's kind of hot. No, go ahead. Thanks. Day gets a little hot, you really notice it. Are you sure you guys don't want a beer? No. No, thanks. Never could drink it out of a can. Seems to taste better in a glass. Well, that's good. Who was the guy, Al? Oh, it's Manny, Manny Phillips. You know where you get in touch with him? I haven't got the slightest idea. Did he ever fall him? Yeah, I did time at Q for GTA. Is he on parole? I don't know. I think he made it free like I told you. I didn't know him real well. Used to hang around, never had much to do with him. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the first time I've seen him since I got out. I've been staring clear of the old bunch. Makes it easier if you don't pal around with him. Business I got's going good. Got no trouble with anybody, and I want it to go on like this. Mm-hmm. Never could figure it. Guy falls out, and right away he's back with the same old bunch. How are you going to stay clean like that? Well, you aren't. Somewhere along the line, you got to make a mistake. You're right back where you started. How long did it take you to learn? I spent four and a half years at the joint. Well, some of them fall harder than that, Al. Yeah? And we still don't learn. Eleven twenty a.m. We called the office, and Sergeants Bob Beck and Officer Art Moner came out to the garage to stake out in case the suspect came back. Frank and I took Al Woodson down to the city hall and checked the name Manny Phillips through R and I. From the packages that were pulled, we were able to get an identification of the man who'd offered the radios for sale. We checked the information contained in the package. Phillips, whose real name was Manuel Richard Phillips, had an arrest record dating back 12 years. He'd spent one year at Fred C. Nella School for Boys for car stripping when he was 14. From the time of his release, he'd been arrested on the average of once every two weeks. His age at the time of his latest release from San Quentin was given as 26. Out of that time, he'd spent a total of eight years in state penal institutions. From his package, we obtained his last recorded address. We checked it out and found that he'd moved three months before. We checked his forwarding address. He'd moved. Finally, after talking to the managers of nine more rooming houses and apartments, we came up with his present residence. The landlady told us that Phillips apparently didn't work for a living, but that he always had the money for his rent. She described him as quiet and said that he usually spent a good part of the daylight hours in his room. She was unable to tell us anything about his friends or any business associates that he might have. A stakeout was set up on the place immediately. Because of the apparent size of the operation, it was decided not to attempt to take the suspect into custody at this time. Instead, Captain Nelson agreed that we should keep Phillips under surveillance and try to learn more about the car stripping gang. For the next week, we followed Phillips. 24 hours a day, there were at least two officers tracing his movements. On three nights, he was watched while he stripped cars of expensive accessories. The area was put under a code five, so there would be no possibility of a suspect learning he was under observation. Eleven days after the surveillance began, Phillips was observed to visit a large marine supply yard down in San Pedro. The next night, July 6th, he drove up to the place at 11.37 p.m. He parked his car in front of the gate and dropped the large bundle over the fence. Immediately afterwards, he returned to his room. The following morning at 8.06 a.m., we met with Sergeant Beck in Captain Nelson's office. What did you find out about the ownership of the supply yard? The license was issued to a Harry Swenson. Well, how about him? 
We checked the name through the eye bureau. Nothing on him there. Beck, you and Molnar come up with anything? Not that you haven't got. He staked out on the yard every night since we found it. Hasn't been a night that passed that some car hasn't made a delivery of some kind. Got the license numbers of all the cars. They've all been checked out. We know who they are and where to find them. We've had a tail on Swenson every minute. He must have eyes in the back of his head. As soon as one of our men falls in step, he knows that the way he's acted, there isn't a thing we can prove. What's the DA's office say about it? We had lunch with Alexander yesterday, Skipper. Laid out the evidence we had. Yeah. Told us if we tried to take Swenson to court with what we've got, they'd laugh us out of town. Well, where does that put you? Well, really not much further than we were. We know who's behind the ring. We know where they're operating from. The big thing now is to find the plant. Unless we can produce the stolen merchandise in Swenson's possession, we haven't got a case that'll stand up. There no leaks about the plant? No, not that we can find. Everybody that's been near Swenson's place has been tailed. Twice a week, there's a truck that leaves the yard. There's no way of telling what's in it, and the times we've followed it, we've lost it. Well, how about a bug? Can you get one into Swenson's office? Well, I don't know how. There's no way of getting them out of there long enough to install one. The night watchman's always on the premises. We're not even sure he's not in on it, too. So where do you stand on it? Well, your guess is as good as ours. Alexander says that without finding the plant, we can't take them to court. Now, we've used every trick in the book to get them to lead us to it, and not one of them's worked. They haven't left a thing open. They're playing it real smart. How many men involved in the operation? Well, we're not sure, but as near as we can figure, 12. That's not counting Swenson or that night watchman. You've been in the business long enough to know it, then. What's that? When there's that many men working, there's got to be a leak someplace. Yeah. Find it. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. At cigarette dealers. In vending machines. At supermarkets and stores coast to coast. Chesterfields, please. Smokers by the thousands. Yes, smokers by the thousands are now changing to Chesterfield. The only cigarette ever to give you one... Proof of low nicotine, highest quality, a matter of record. Two, the only cigarette ever to give you this proven record with smokers. Again and again, over a full year and one half, a group of Chesterfield smokers have been given thorough medical examinations. The doctor's reports are again a matter of record. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. A responsible independent research laboratory supervises this continuing program. Chesterfield. Best for me, best for you. For the next week, a close surveillance was kept on Swenson's marine supply yard, but there were no breaks. Kickbacks from George Bratton up at CII in Sacramento and from Washington, D.C. didn't disclose any previous criminal record on the suspect. During that week on Tuesday, July 11th and on Thursday, July 13th, a large steak truck left the yard. The back of the truck was covered with a piece of canvas so that we were unable to see what was in it, but we were reasonably sure that it contained stolen merchandise. In scouting the neighborhood for a possible place to establish a more workable stakeout, we came across an empty office on the second floor of the building directly across the street from Swenson's place of business. Officers equipped with binoculars maintained a constant watch on the activities in the yard. After another week, the events that had been seen were reported to Assistant District Attorney Adolf Alexander, and he stated that if we could get pictures of the operation, we might be able to make a case that would stand up in court. Monday, July 17th, we met with Sergeant Putoff in the crime lab. How far are you going to have to be from the subject, Joe? Well, second floor across the street. Are you going to be able to take all the pictures during the day? Don't think so, Putoff. Most of the activity runs after nine at night. Mm-hmm. Well, best bet probably be infrared, then. We can shoot it with a 4 by 5 How about light? Oh, is there any sort of telephone pole, traffic signal in front of the place? Yeah, I think so. The way I remember it, there's a phone pole about 10 feet to the left of the gate as you face the yard. Oh, well, we can tie the lights to that, then. Well, any chance they could be spotted? Outside. We can put them up pretty high. The regular lamp reflectors with heavy infrared filters. If you know they're there and look up, you're going to be able to spot them. Any chance of taking movies? Mm, yeah, we can swing that. Life magazine's been experimenting with a new fast film. Results I've seen with it are pretty amazing. All you need is one street lamp. We can use that. Well, if you have to string the infrared lights, wouldn't it be better to shoot the movies on that kind of film? Well, you'd get something. Film's pretty slow, though. It'd be better to use the stuff life's come up with. All right. How long will it take you to set it up? Well, how careful do we have to be? Well, these guys are pretty cagey. If they get any idea at all, we're dead. Mm-hmm. Well, we can have a couple of men go out in the morning and outfit them as linemen. They should be able to have the rig ready for you by tomorrow night. We can start shooting pictures then, huh? Should be able to, yeah. All right. Is Jay Allen around, do you know? Well, I think he's over the court this morning, Joe. 
Well, then maybe you can help us out there, too. What's that? We're trying to figure some way to tail a truck. We've been trying to find the plant these guys are using for a couple of weeks now, and we just can't get near them. We wondered if Jay might have any ideas on that. Probably use fluorescent paint. That ought to do it. What's the gimmick there? They tie a can of transparent fluorescent lacquer to the back of the truck, punch a hole in the can, and all you got to do is follow the drops. You punch a hole in the can, won't all the stuff run out? Well, there's a couple of brands on the market. They've got enough viscosity so the paint will stay in the can, regulate the frequency of the drops by the size of the hole. Can you see it? Not without ultraviolet lamp. Tie one of those to the hood of your car and you got it made. You got the equipment here to do that? Mm-hmm. Well, would you have Jay give us a call when he comes in? Right. He'll know more about it than I do. Be able to give you all the dope. Okay. I'll get right on the other for you. Thanks a lot. Say, how long have you been after this bunch? Well, let's see. We got the assignment on June 13th. That'd make it over a month now. A lot of time. Well, maybe now we'll have something to show for it. The following morning, Tuesday, July 18th, two men from the crime lab installed three 1,000-watt lamps in front of the marine supply yard. The reflectors were equipped with heavy infrared filters. Test exposures from our position across the street indicated that whatever pictures we got would be recognizable enough as to be admitted in a court of law. The new fast film was obtained, and 16-millimeter cameras were installed in the window of the office across the street from Swenson's. We talked with Sergeant Jay Allen in the crime lab, and he went to work on the use of the fluorescent paint. After experimenting, he was able to come up with the correct size hole in the bottom of the can so that a single drop of the lacquer would fall from the can every 10 seconds. A portable ultraviolet lamp was obtained and was ready for immediate installation on our car. For the next three nights, we sat in our vantage point and we photographed all activity on the suspect's premises. The pictures were shown to Adolph Alexander in the district attorney's office, and he told us that they would play a large part in the prosecution of the case. However, he said that if we could come up with the hiding place of the stolen loot, the conviction would be assured. Tuesday morning, July 25th, 3.15 a.m., Frank and I took the can of fluorescent paint and climbed the fence into the supply yard. Back here. Right. Thing I didn't see. All right, you better hold it a minute. Who's there? The watchman. Yeah. Better get back in the shadows. Yeah, come on, easy. Come on out. I know you're there. Come on now. Who is it? Let's go. The truck should be back in the shed. Right. All right, here we are. There's a can. You want to hang it? I'll keep an eye out. All right. Can't get this thing on here. Who huh? thought up this handle? This didn't work at all. Wait a minute. Can you bend it down? Yeah. Give me your handkerchief. Wait a minute. A sharp edge on this wire. Okay, here it is. All right, wait a minute. We still clear there? Yeah. How about that watchman? He went back. Right there we are. How about the stopper in the can? I got it in place. The first bump should knock it out. I hope so. Well, it's got to work. All right, now let's try to get out of here. See if you can kick something else, will you, on the way? Tuesday night at 11.35 p.m., the stake truck pulled out of Swenson's Marine Supply Yard. Sergeant Bob Beck, Frank, and I were parked in an alley just down the street. We let the truck get a good 20-minute start on us, and then the ultraviolet lamp was attached to the hood of our car. Frank started the motor, and we pulled out into the street. Spot anything yet? No. Maybe the lacquer dried up around the cork, held it in place. Well, that's a happy thought. Well, here's the corner. Which way? Well, wait a minute. Let's take a chance straight ahead, huh? All right. Well, there's nothing up this way. You better double back. Okay. Let's try it to the left this time. How about it? See anything yet? Go on up a little more, will you? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Look at that stuff. It's really lit up. For the next 35 minutes, we followed the trail left by the fluorescent paint. From time to time, we'd lose the trail, but we'd always pick it up again. 
The truck followed the main highway from San Pedro to Santa Monica and then turned left up Santa Monica Canyon. The trail wound around towards Sunset Boulevard and turned to the left. About one mile from the beach, the drops indicated that the truck had left the main street and turned onto a private dirt road. Half a mile along the road, the trail stopped in front of a large wooden building in the middle of a field. We turned off the car lights and went up to the place. The blinds on the windows were drawn, but there were lights on in a front room. Sergeant Beck covered the rear of the building, and Frank and I went up to the front door. All right. Yeah. What are you doing in here? Police officers. You're under arrest. For what? Is there anybody else here in the building? What are you arresting me for? You want to check with Beck, Frank? Right. What are you doing coming in here like this? You got no right coming around kicking doors All right, in. Save it, Swenson. How do you know my name? We've been watching you for a month now. Is there anybody else in this house? No. Do you own this place? I'm not answering anything till I see a lawyer. All right, you call it any way you want. We can find out. Got no right in here. I'm going to see my lawyer. You do that, Swenson. What's the charge? Burglary. You think you can make it stick? We're going to try, Mister. Where's your evidence? You got to have evidence. We got it. There's nobody else here, Joe. Back room's full of stuff. Radios, heaters, tires, all here. So what? You can't put me away for that. All right, let's go, Swenson. Now, just a minute. Will you listen to me a minute? All right. Well, you got this all wrong. You're making a big mistake here. I intend to pay for every bit of that stuff back there. I'm going to pay for it. Yeah, that's right. You will. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 12th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we'd like to express our appreciation to all of you who've made our Dragnet theme song so popular. Whenever or wherever you hear it, we hope it'll remind you to try our Chesterfields. To join the thousands who are changing to Chesterfields and getting the one cigarette that's low in nicotine, highest in quality. Chesterfield, best for me, best for you. All other members of the gang were taken into custody and were brought to trial. Harry Ralph Swenson, along with his accomplices, was tried and convicted of 14 counts of burglary in the second degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than 15 years. If you had only one book, the Bible, do you know that you would have within its covers the finest examples of literature, both in prose and poetry? You'd have stories which have never been equaled, adventure, love, history, and prophecy. So read your Bible every day during National Bible Week. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely new Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork tip Fatima? It's the smooth smoke with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Fatima is made and guaranteed by Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Try Fatima today. Hear Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune tonight on the NBC Radio Network.